Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the 15th episode in which, rather than Hinata's father, a young Uzumaki Naruto foils Kyumo's kidnapping attempt. However, he receives a severe wound in the process, jeopardizing his shinobi career. That is, if not for a certain fox stepping in and offering Naruto the Hokage to be a reward for his heroism. Witness Naruto's newfound power and unique perspective. This story comes from Story Seeker 7. Make certain to support him, her. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Wave, outside Tazuna's house it was early in the morning, the sun just starting to rise, when the members of teams 8 and 11 gathered in front of their jonin senseis. The group gathered together in a wooded area close to Tazuna's home, near a small lake. Naruto had about a dozen pairs of eyes watching the house. Shursue looked over at Kurinai, who nodded at him. He returned the gesture and looked at the six genin. All right then, he said. We have about six days until we see Zabuza again. Possibly less time, possibly more time. It depends on how good our hunter Neen is at being a doctor. Regardless of how much time we have, I intend to make good use of it, Shursue gestured over to Kurinai, who was holding onto a crutch. To the members of Team 8, you will be joining my team in the morning for training. Kurinai nodded at Shursue as she stepped forward with the help of her crutch. I know this is unusual, she said to her genin. But given the circumstances, I won't be able to train you guys. We can still work on mental exercises and some chakra control. But for the rest of the training, I'm afraid I won't be much help right now. Do you understand? The Genin members of Team 8 nodded their heads. Of course, we do, Kurinai sensei Sakura said, stepping forward. You need to recover. Kiba had a cocky grin on his face. Yeah, he said. Besides, this could be a chance to learn something awesome from another jonin. Why pass that up? Who knows, maybe he'll like us better than his own team. Careful Kiba, Sasuke said. We're right here. Wouldn't want any unfortunate accidents to happen now. Would we? Naruto said, giving the Inazuka boy a devious grin. Kiba's smile faltered for a second. Well, it could happen, he said. So, what are you going to do first? Shursue crossed his arms. First off, I want to see how your chakra control is, he said. I understand that your sensei is having you guys work on the three climbing techniques, correct? Sakura nodded. Yeah, it was one of the first things she had us do, she said. Even though we already knew how to do. Kurinai looked at Shursue. I wanted to refine whatever they already knew, she explained. Even had them work on the leaf technique several times. Naruto nodded to himself. That was what Shursue had been doing with them since the formation of Team 11. Though he had managed to throw in a few new things to teach them. Then show me, he said. Then he pointed to the nearby trees. You three pick a tree and climb. All right, Kiba said walking forward, the rest of Team 8 close behind. But I don't get why we have to do this. Why not show us how to do some awesome new technique that will wipe the floor with Zabuza and the fake Hunter Neen? Shursue smiled at him. If you behave, maybe I will, he said. But in all honesty, flashy jutsu are not going to help us here. Zabuza and his accomplice are tough opponents, and you will need every advantage you can get. And that means. Not wasting any chakra, Kurinai said, stepping in. The less you waste your energy, the more you will have in the long run. Yeah, yeah, Kiba said. The genin of Team 8 walked up to the trees. Then, one by one, they started to walk up the trunks of the trees. See, we can do the tree walking technique. Like Sakura said. But can you reach the top of the trees? Shursue asked. The look on Kiba's face faltered for a second as he looked up at the tree he was on. Sure, we can do that, he said. Right, guys, he looked at his teammates, getting no response from either. 
Naruto and Sasuke smiled. What's wrong, Kiba? Naruto asked. Afraid of heights? Sasuke chirped. Kiba growled and glared at the boys. No, I'm not, he defended himself. I'm just. Naruto and Sasuke repressed the smiles on their faces when Kiba came tumbling down the tree. Kurinai shook her head, and an exasperated sigh escaped her lips. Kiba, what have I told you about losing your focus? She asked. Akamaru, the ever faithful companion, walked up to Kiba and licked the side of his face. Kiba growled. It's not my fault, he said, pulling himself up. Then he pointed at Naruto and Sasuke. Those two distracted me. What? Naruto said. All we did was just talk to you. Right, Sasuke? Sasuke nodded. Besides, you're the one that fell down the tree, not us. Oh, yeah? Kiba said. I would like to see you do better, he smiled, showing some fangs. Naruto turned his head to face Shursue. Sensei? He asked. Shursue shrugged. Go ahead, he said. Might serve as some motivation for Kiba. Naruto turned his head and nodded to Sasuke. He smirked and nodded back. Come on, he said, walking forward. Let's show the mutt how it's done. Hey! By this point, Shino and Sakura had reached the top of their respective trees. They were watching the spectacle. About fifteen seconds later, they were joined by Naruto and Sasuke. How you two doing? Naruto asked. Just fine, Sakura said with an amused smile. Shino silently nodded. And enjoying seeing our teammate putting his foot in mouth, he said. Wow, Shino making a joke. Naruto was going to have to check if the world was ending. Naruto and Sasuke smiled down at the dumbfounded Inazuka. His mouth was wide open enough that a fly could go in. Come on, Sasuke said, walking down the tree. Before Kiba chokes on something. Naruto snorted but walked down his tree. Moments later, the four genin were back on the ground. See, Kiba, Naruto said, smiling at the boy. It's easy. Kiba closed his mouth and looked away. Well, I could have done that, he said. If you two hadn't distracted me. Now, now, Kiba, Kurinai said with a smile. You can try again. Kiba rolled his eyes and started to walk up his tree slowly. So, Shursue sensei he said. Are you going to show us something? Or are you just going to have us climb trees all day? That would depend on how ready Kurinai thinks you are, Shursue asked. He turned to face. The Jinjutsu specialist. So, what do you think? Is your team ready for the next exercise? Kurinai sighed. I would have liked to have given them a little more time, she said. But given the circumstances, learning this now would help. Show us what? Kiba shouted from his tree. He was getting close to the top. We're going to show you how to walk on water, Shursue said. A confused look appeared on Sakura's face. Walk on water? She asked. Wait, like you were doing with your fight with Zabuza? Shursue nodded. Exactly, he said. It's a beneficial technique for more than just refining your chakra control. Once Kiba gets down, I'll show you. About a minute later, they were gathered by the nearby lake. Now observe, Shursue said. Kiba was next to Naruto and Sasuke. So, can he really walk on water? He asked in a whisper. Naruto gave him a pointed look, followed by Sasuke. Well, yeah, Naruto answered. Weren't you watching the fight with Zabuza? All three of them were standing on the lake? Kiba smiled sheepishly and rubbed the back of his head. I thought that was just more tricks, he said. You know, genjutsu and stuff. Again, Naruto looked at the Inazuka boy with an even look. 
you just walk up a tree, he pointed out. And I have floating eyeballs. Several flew around Kiba. Fair point, Kiba said. If commentary from the peanut gallery is done, Shursway said. I was about to demonstrate the water walking technique. The genin stood at attention. Hi sensei, the boys said. Shursway nodded and took a breath. Then he took a step out onto the lake. Then another, and another, and another. Shursway was about half a meter away when he turned to face the genin. The water walking technique, he said. An advanced form of chakra control training and means of travel over water, he opens his arms wide, gesturing to the lake. To any ordinary person, this lake would be an impassable boundary. Something to go around, to go across it, they would need a boat or be a good swimmer. But for us, we can just walk across it. Karinai stepped up beside the genin. Now, this isn't anything like with the tree walking exercise, she said. Unlike with a tree, the surface of water is constantly shifting. Even if you don't see it, water is always in constant change. So, tell me, what do you think you'll have to do to stay on the water? Team, 11, you don't have to answer this, she gave Shursway a sideways glance. I suspect you already know the answer. Kiba looked at the members of Team, 11 with surprise. You already know this? he asked. When? Naruto didn't turn his head when he answered. But he did have a grin that he knew Kiba could see. Of course, we do, he said. How else do you think we got here so quickly? See, he channeled his churka to the soles of his feet and stepped out onto the surface. Sasuke and Hinata did the same thing. All three turned to face the stunned expressions of Team 8, or in Shino's case, a slight head nod. Sakura was the first to snap out of her stupor and had a thoughtful expression. So, if the surface of the water is constantly shifting, we can't just keep a steady stream of chakra going to our feet. Right? Kiba and Shino had recovered and were now looking at their sensei. Karinai smiled. Correct, Sakura, she said. If you were just to do that and only that, you would fall into the water. Sure sway, would you mind demonstrating? Shursue looked at the water around him. You sure it has to be me? he asked. Karinai smiled at him. You're not the one on crunches right now, she pointed out. We have three genin out on. Shursue tried to point to his genin on the lake. They waved back from the land, smiles and all. A frown appears on Shursue's face. Little traitors, he grumbles. Then he shrugs. Fine, it's good I know how to swim. He raises his foot up into the air. Now watch carefully, he said. The genin could see a faint blue glow coming from his foot. He lowered the foot, moving it forward, where it made contact with the water. It looked like it would hold for a second, but then the foot sunk into the water. Shursue tried to regain his balance as his foot started to sink into the water, but his foot kept sinking into the water. Then, he fell into the water altogether. His head bobbed to the surface, where he gave the people on the land a smile. And that is what will happen if you can't figure this exercise out, Karinai said, smiling and turning her head to face the genin. Now, can anyone figure out how you stay on the water and not in it? Shino spoke. So, if the water is in a constant state of change, and the channeling churka to our feet alone is not enough. Then, it stands to reason that we must constantly change the chakra output we are channeling to our feet. Is this correct? Karinai smiled. An interesting idea, Shino, she said. What do you two think? Sakura had a finger to her lips. I was thinking the same thing, she said. With the tree walking technique, all you had to worry about was not using too much or too little chakra. So, keeping the channel chakra to a consistent level was okay. But with walking on water, it's a little different. Everyone turned their attention to Kiba. The Inazuka boy sheepishly rubbed the back of his head. 
Yeah, I guess that sounds about right, he said, getting eye rolls from everyone. The Jonin senseis had amused smiles on their faces. Shino was right, Kurinai said. You must constantly control how much chakra you channel to your feet. Or else you'll end up like poor Shursui here. Hey now, Shursui said, climbing out of the water. I did that on purpose, then he looked at the genin. That said. It's not as easy as it looks. You must always be the mind of your chakra control while over the water. But with enough time and practice, you can do it unconsciously. Once you have mastered the water walking technique, you can do what Karina and I did. Being able to fight your opponent while on the surface of a lake, Karina finished. Or a river or the ocean. Really, any body of water. In fact, get enough at it, and you might be able to walk up a waterfall. Both Naruto and Kiba perked up. Even Sasuke and Shino showed signs they were interested. Being able to walk up a waterfall, Naruto said quietly to himself. Now, that would be pretty cool. He heard a low chuckle in the back of his mind. Trust me, Kit, what she is talking about is scratching the surface of what you can with enough control over your chakra, Kurama said. I know techniques and exercises that would have the woman with red eyes drooling like an Inazuka. Now, Naruto was intrigued. Care to tell me any of them? Naruto asked the Kyubi. He heard a snort from the fox. Perhaps, he said lazily. But only when I think you are ready for them. In the meantime, try to keep the noise down. I'm trying to get some sleep here. Naruto frowned. Lazy furball, Naruto mutters. Would like to see you do some of the work for once. With the little mental conversation done, Naruto turned his attention back to the training session. Kurinai was now having her genin making their attempts at walking on water. Naruto was going to enjoy watching Kiba fall into the water. Later that day, near Gato's hideout, well, that's an unusual design, Shursui comments. Naruto nodded. He had thought the same thing when he saw the building. It looked like a upside-down spinning top hung in the air. So, not only is this Gato guy a thug, but he's also on the eccentric side, he said. Naruto saw Shursui shrug his shoulders. Takes all types, I guess, Shursui said. So, you think this is where Gato is? Naruto asked. Following this morning's training, Shursui had taken Naruto to the docks described by Kiba and Sasuke. From there, they followed the road they discovered. That led them to here. Shursui nodded. Very likely, he said. But just to be sure. He looked at Naruto. Naruto nodded and held his arm out. Channeling a bit of chakra, the seals on the arm started to glow a faint blue light. Pop. 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 In puffs of smoke, pairs of eyes appeared above his arm. About ten in total, they then flew off towards the strange-looking building. Shursui had a pleased look in his eyes. Speaking of, he said. How are your other eyes? Naruto nodded, knowing what he was talking about. On their way here, the two encountered some of Gato's thugs. The thugs were knocked out before they knew about the shinobi's presence. When they were unconscious, Naruto took the liberty of taking their eyes and putting them back into their heads. How are they doing? Shursui asked. Any trouble seeing through them? Naruto shook his head. No trouble at all, he said. I can see just fine. Though I find it annoying that I can't control where they are going, most of them were in the town, some of whom were harassing the townsfolk. One was at the docks doing nothing. Shursui nodded. Nothing we can do about that, he said. But it does offer a handy way of getting your eyes inside other places. Not that it was difficult to start with. Do any of the thugs show signs they might be aware that something is wrong? Naruto thought about it for a moment. 
He tried to recall if any of the thugs whose eyes he controlled did anything that suggested side effects to this new technique. They do rub their eyes a lot, he said. And sometimes they'll rub their heads. Shursui nodded. That would suggest your new ability can cause eye discomfort and headaches, he said. It's something we'll have to study once we get back to the village. Naruto nodded. It wasn't something he was looking forward to, and he imagined the condemned prisoners that would be volunteered for the studies wouldn't like it either. My eyes are in, he said. His eyes started to navigate the maze of hallways inside the building. Good, Shursui said. Try to find out where Gato is or any sign that he might be staying here. Naruto nodded. Got it, he said. They remained silent as Naruto's sights went through the odd building. Every now and then, Naruto would report what he was seeing. Like how many rooms he saw or how many thugs appeared to be staying in it, which was a lot. At the same time, Naruto memorized everything he saw. Quickly creating a mental map of the place. He noted where the barracks for the thugs were, where they kept their supplies and weapons. He saw where they ate, where most of them hung out. And he saw where they kept their prisoners. A tight frown appeared on Naruto's face. Something that Shursui took notice of. Something wrong, Naruto? I just found where they're keeping their prisoners, Naruto said, trying to keep his tone even. Prisoners? Shursui said. What kind of prisoners? Most of them are women, Naruto said. More than a few were girls around Hinata's age or younger. Naruto thought he even saw a couple of young boys. It was hard to tell with how huddled together they all were. Most had vacant looks in their eyes. A look flashed across Shursui's face. I see, he said. I shouldn't be surprised they would do that. Keep looking for Gato. We'll worry about the prisoners later. Naruto wanted to protest. He wanted to go in there and rescue everyone Gato's thugs had taken. But Naruto knew Shursui was right. They were here for recon and nothing else. To try anything else would risk the mission and the rest of the team. Silently, Naruto tore his sights away from the prisoners and continued to search the building for Gato. Found him, Naruto said. The rat is at the top of the building, sleeping in a luxurious bed surrounded by equally luxurious decorations. Naruto's blood boiled at the thought that this man was living in the lap of luxury while the rest of Wave starved. While innocent people were made into playthings just below him. Shursui snorted. Typical civilian arrogance, he said. So now we know where Gato is staying. What about? Zabuza and his accomplice? Looking, Naruto said. Hang on, I think I just found them, it was in a room a few levels below Gato's room. A large circular room with a bed in the middle. A young girl, maybe two or three years older than Naruto, was sitting by the bed. Nursing an injured and very annoyed looking Zabuza. Zabuza is here, Naruto said. He's laying in a bed being attended to by a girl. I think she might be the hunter Neen. She did seem to match the description of the hunter they encountered. Roughly the same height, body shape, and hairstyles matched. She was even wearing the same clothes. Shursui nodded. Good, he said. Can you get a closer look? See what Zabuza's condition is. Hold on, Naruto said. He moved his eyes closer to Zabuza. The girl stiffened. Oh, Naruto thought and tried to pull his eyes away. But too late, the girl spun around and threw some sunbon into the air. The next thing Naruto knew, his sight in the room went black. Shit, Naruto cursed under his breath. Shursui was looking at him. Something wrong, Naruto? The girl sensed my eyes, Naruto said. She just took them out. A frown appeared on Shursui's face. Then I say it's time to leave, he said. Come on, we got more than enough here today. Naruto nodded and followed after Shursui. He wouldn't forget what he saw today, not with thoughts of Hinata playing through his mind. 
Hideout Haku tentatively picked up the eyeballs she had just screwed. Not something she had thought she would do in her life. She was careful not to crush them. What the hell is with you, Haku, she heard her master shout from across the room. Haku stood up and walked up to her master's bed. See for yourself, she said, putting the eyeballs on the side of the bed where Zabuza could see them. Zabuza raised a non-existent eyebrow. Eyeballs? he questioned, looking between them and Haku. Haku nodded and sat back down in her chair. I felt like someone, or something was watching us, she explained. I can only assume these were the culprits. Zabuza nodded. I was getting the same feeling, he said. Thought my paranoia was getting to me. Haku nodded. It wasn't an uncommon feeling for them. Being on the run from Kiri tended to give one a habit of looking over their shoulders. Even though they hadn't seen any of the hunters for more than a year now. Haku looked at the eyeballs, three pairs in. Two green and one brown. What do you think? She asked. And do you think there are more of them? I would bet on it, Zabuza answered. As for what they are, I can't really say. My best guess is they're part of a new technique we haven't seen. Maybe even a Jenk Kenkai. Haku shifted uncomfortably at the mention of Jenkei Kenkai. It had been years, but her life in Kiri still haunted her to this day. Do you think it could be the Kanohanin? She asked. Zabuza nodded. Hi, he replied. We've heard rumors that Kanoha has gotten their hands on a new Genkei Kenkai. Haku nodded. They had heard that rumor shortly before coming to Wave. They didn't put much stock into it, as rumors about the major villages always floated around. Sometimes they would be vague, and sometimes they would be more specific. In either case, there was no way they could confirm the rumors. So, what do we do now? Haku asked. Do we inform Gato of this development? Zabuza shook his head. The little midget would never believe us, he said. You know how civilians can be. Most of them think the tales of us shinobi are all made up. No, we keep this to ourselves. Haku nodded. Very well then, she said. Haku considered for a moment about relocating her master to somewhere else. Their location had been compromised after all. But then she discarded the possibility. Zabuza was in no condition to be relocated. Zabuza nodded and looked up at the ceiling. For now, we'll try to keep any prying eyes from spying on us, he said. They can have free reign on the rest of the building. Haku nodded and turned her attention, treating her master. She noticed that they were getting low medicinal herds. She would have to collect more the next morning. Town in Wave Kiba decided that he hated patrol. Especially when he was told to do nothing if he saw anything. Walking through the nearby town, he and Shino saw a lot of things. He and Shino were walking through the street, acting like street orphans. Kiba suppressed a low growl when he saw a thug and knock an old man into the street, laughing. Reflexively Kiba's hands curled into fists. A hand on his shoulder stopped him from doing anything else. Kiba looked over his shoulder, seeing Shino giving him a cold stare. Remember our mission, he said. Recon, don't draw attention to ourselves. Kiba looked at his teammate for a long second before he snorted and looked away. He uncurled his fists. Yeah, whatever, he said. Kiba looked at the old man as he struggled to get to his feet. The frown on Kiba's face never left when he looked away. Akamaru tried to comfort him by wagging his tail and licking the bottom of his chin. Kiba smiled and looked down at his partner hidden in his shirt. Thanks, buddy, he said, petting Akamaru on the head. The little dog let out a pleased bark. Kiba looked around, feeling his frown returning. How can anyone be doing this, he asked softly. Coming from Kanoha, Kiba was used to a much different lifestyle. 
He was used to seeing people smile as they walked down the streets and got used to the noise of conversation in shops and the marketplaces. He was used to seeing children running around and laughing. He wasn't used to seeing people shamble from one end of the street to the other. He wasn't used to seeing empty shops and stalls. He wasn't used to seeing starving children in the streets. Wave was a far cry from Kanoha. Granted, Kiba knew his home village wasn't a perfect place to live. Kanoha had its fair share of problems. He would have to be blind not to see. That. Naruto's life before being taken in by the Hyuga was one example. And Kiba had seen beggars in Kanoha before. But never anything like this. How can Gato be treating the people like this? Kiba asked. Shouldn't he be helping the people of Wave? Kiba didn't expect an answer, least of all from Shino. Not all care for the collective, he said. Some are more concerned with themselves than the well-being of the whole. Kiba looked at Shino, surprised he would say anything. Then he nodded. For all the differences they and their respective clans had, they had one thing in common. They looked out for their packs. Kiba looked at the misery around them. Still, how can anyone let this guy and his thugs walk over them like this? Kiba asked. Why don't they fight back? If this had been Kanoha, Gato, and the goons would have been dead within the hour. Then again, Kiba had to remind himself that this was not Kanoha or the Land of Fire. They're afraid, Shino said. To them, Gato and his men are an invincible army. Kiba snorted. They're not, he said. They're just a bunch of thugs with swords. I doubt they even know how to use those things. We know that, Shino said. He stopped at the side of an empty building. But they don't. And Gato controls this country's only means of getting food and supplies. Kiba frowned. Tazuna had mentioned something about Wave being unable to support itself, so it relied on trade to survive. So, Gato can just starve the country out if he wanted to, and already was doing. Shino nodded and pushed his glasses up. There is something else I sense, he said. Something that has felt off about the people ever since we arrived. Kiba stared at Shino. He had felt the same thing but never could put words to it. Go on, he said. But before Shino could answer, a piercing crying ripped through the air. Both boys whirled around to face the source, hands instinctively going for hidden kunai pouches. An angry growl escaped from Kiba, and he could hear a low buzzing sound from Shino. A woman was screaming as she was dragged away by two men into an alleyway. Someone, please help me. Tears were streaming down her eyes as she screamed and struggled. Please help me. HMMPTH. One of the men clamped his hand over her mouth, muffling her cries for help. Be quiet bitch, he said. No one's coming to save you. So, just relax and enjoy. Like hell, Kiba was going to let that happen. He steps up, ready to beat the two men bloody. Yet again, Shino stopped him by placing a hand on his shoulders. Kiba turned his head, shooting his teammate an angry glare. Shino, he growled. He was expecting a reminder that they had orders. We need to be careful, he said. We can't draw attention to ourselves. Kiba was about to offer a protest when his mind started to process what he was saying. He calmed down just a little and nodded at Shino. What's the plan? Shino walked up the street. Follow me, he said. A few moments. Later, the duo were on a rooftop overlooking the alleyway the men had dragged the woman into. No one had noticed them getting there. Remember, we have to make it look like they killed each other, Shino said calmly. Kiba nodded. Got you, he said. A part of him, though, felt uneasy. He knew what these men were about to do, and they deserved what was coming to them. Yet, at the same time, Kiba knew this would be his and Shino's first kill. Could they really do it? Well, they'll find out soon enough. 
one of the men slammed the woman into a wall. She let out a cry of pain as the man backed away from her. All right now, the man said with a wide grin. Little lady, take them off. The woman scrambled up against the wall. No, she screamed. The man and his partner frowned at the woman. That wasn't a request, he said. So, I will say this again, take them off. The woman shook her head. I won't, she said, crossing her arms over her chest. The man's frown turned into an angry sneer. I said, he replied, reaching his hand out. Take them off. Now. Shino said, leaping off the rooftop. Kiba quickly followed. The pair landed between the woman and the two men. What the? One said. That was as far as he got. Kiba and Shino charged at the men. With the short distance between them and the element of surprise, the men never had a chance. Kiba pulled a kunai out and plunged it into one of the men's chests. The man tried to scream, but Kiba shot his hand out over it, muffling the noise. The man was sent falling back to the ground from the impact of Kiba's body hitting his. The Inazuka boy landed on top of the man, keeping his kanai in his chest, and twisted it. The man screamed more, but Kiba held his hand over his mouth. Kiba kept looking at the man in his eyes. Even as the light left them and, his struggles began to cease. It was something that Kiba would never forget. Eventually, the man's struggles stopped completely, and Kiba stared into lifeless eyes. Kiba took his kanai out of the man's chest and slowly stopped. For a second, he stared at the man he had just killed. His face was twisted and frozen in an expression of horror and shock. He was vaguely aware of Shino stepping beside him. It is done, he said. His voice was shakier than Kiba remembered. Kiba numbly nodded. He was still staring at the dead man. Was this what it felt like to kill a person? Kiba almost jumped when he felt a hand on his shoulder. He looked over seeing Shino staring at him. Process later, he said. Then he turned around. For now, we have other things to attend to. Kiba turned around, seeing the woman staring at them with fear in her eyes. Right, he had forgotten about her. Kiba nodded. Right, he said. Kiba stepped up to the woman. The woman let out a startled cry. Please don't come near me, she said, backing herself up against the wall. Kiba stopped in his tracks and held his hands up to show he meant no harm. It's okay. We're not here. To hurt you, he said calmly. You're going to be okay. Kiba stepped a little closer to the woman. The woman was looking at him and Shino timidly. You're not going to hurt me? She said. Kiba smiled at her. Of course not, he said. He then gestured to the dead men. Otherwise, we wouldn't have stopped those men. The last word he spat out like it was an insult. He is right, Shino said. You have no need to fear us. Not fear from those men again. The woman still looked uncertain. But then Akamaru jumped out of Kiba's shirt and approached the woman. He stopped beside his feet and placed a paw on her foot. The woman looked down at the puppy, wagging his tail and barking happily at her. The woman looked confused for a second, but then a smile broke out across her face. She knelt down and started to pet Akamaru, who let out a happy whine. Good little doggy, she said. Then she looked up at Kiba and Shino. The suspicion in her eyes was gone. Thank you. Without you, I don't know what I would have done. Kiba felt himself blushing, so he hid it by looking down and scratching the back of his head. D don't mention it, he said. We just couldn't let those guys get away with what they were doing. The woman nodded and smiled. But thank you still, she said. She stood up and bowed to the two genin. I'm forever in your debt. You can repay us by getting home safe, Shino said. Do you need one of us to escort you? The woman shook her head. 
No, she replied. I can find my way home safely. Then she looked over the corpses of the men. What are you going to do about those two? Kiba and Shino looked back at the dead men. Kiba had a frown on his face at seeing them. Don't worry about them, he said, waving the woman off. He turned back to face her. We'll take care of them. The woman nodded and walked out from the wall. Thank you again, she said. Then she walked away, though not before spitting on the bodies. You sure she will be safe on her way back? Shino asked, stepping up beside Kiba. Kiba nodded. She'll know to avoid Gato's men, he said. Plus, he points to the air at a pair of eyeballs watching them. She'll have someone watching her. Shino nodded. Then he turned his head to face Kiba. I didn't think you had it in you, he said. Kiba pretended he didn't know what his teammate meant. Had what in me? He asked, hoping Shino would drop the subject. Kiba had no such luck. Chivery, Shino said. I didn't think you could be so chivalrous around a woman like that. I think Ino and Sakura would be proud. Kiba blushed and looked away. Yeah, well, he started to defend himself. Then he sighed. I just have a lot more respect for women than you guys think. I might not act like it, but I do, it was the truth. He really did have a lot of respect for women. It shouldn't be that surprising. Just look at his mother and sister. Shino nodded. We know that, he said. Even the girls know that. Kiba snorted. Well, don't tell. Anyone I just admitted it, he said. Then he turned his attention to the dead bodies. Come on, we got a job to do, he added hesitantly. Shino nodded. Remember, we have to make it look like they did this to themselves, he said. Kiba nodded slowly. Yeah, I know that, he said. It wasn't anything he was looking forward to. Tazuna's home that night, everyone was gathered around the table, reporting the day's events. So, two more of your men quit today, Shursui said. Tazuna let out a sigh. Yeah, he said. They said they didn't feel like they were getting paid enough for the job. But we all know what the real reason was. Naruto nodded. Gato's men must have threatened the workers or their families. Not that Naruto could blame them. Thugs they may be, they were armed and dangerous thugs. Something that an ordinary person would be smart to be afraid of. Thankfully, Naruto and his friends were anything but ordinary. Will you be able to complete the bridge? Naruto asked. With so many of your guys quitting like this. Won't it be hard getting the bridge done? Bah! Tazuna sounded out. I don't need those cowards. I'll build the bridge all by myself if I have to. I'm a super bridge builder, after all. The best in the whole world, well, at least he had confidence. Naruto looked over at Shursui, getting a similarly worried look from him. While I won't dispute your skill, Tazuna-san, he said. I don't think it will come to that. You have plenty of brave men under your watch. Naruto nodded. He's right, he said. And while we're here. We'll make sure to protect them. You have my word on that. Tazuna eyed him warily before a small smile broke out across his face. Thank, he was cut off. Why? A new voice joined the conversation. One Naruto was already familiar with. A frown broke across Naruto's face. Everyone else turned their attention to the source. Inari was glaring at them like he did the night before. Why do you even bother? You're all going to die anyway. Gato is too strong. Look here, you little punk, Kiba barked out. You don't know what you're talking about. We're way stronger than that fat mig, an arm from Shursui stopped him. Shursui gave Kiba a look, telling him to be quiet. Then he looked over at the young boy. While I appreciate the concern for us, he started to say. You don't have to fear for our safety. 
We have a job to do, and as Kanoha Shinobi, we will not fail. So, you don't have to. What do you know, the little boy shouted. What do you know about suffering? In your village, all of you live happy, comfortable lives. You don't know anything about hardship. The air in the dining room grew thick as silence fell over the room. Then, very slowly, everyone turned their heads to face Naruto. The air around the boy seemed to be unsettled. Despite having a blindfold on, he had a glare that could melt the mountains. Silently, Naruto stood up. And Naruto, Hinata said weakly. But Naruto did not hear her. Then, slowly, and deliberately, Naruto raised his hands and pulled them to the back of his head. I don't know anything about hardship? He asked quietly, but everyone could hear him. He undid the blindfold around his head. I don't know anything about suffering? He pulled the blindfold away from his eyes. Three separate gasps could be heard in the room. Tazuna looked like he was going to be sick, while his daughter looked like she wanted to cry. Inari was frozen in place by shock and fear, and Naruto continued to glare at him with empty eye sockets. Grow up, Naruto said in a low tone. You are not the only one who has suffered. There are people out there who have it worse than you. There are people at this table that have known hardship. My family almost tore itself apart, Sasuke said. In the worst way possible. I saw my mother stabbed in the stomach by a cousin. I felt her blood on my face as she fought to protect me. Shursway nodded. I had to kill a good number of my clansmen that night, he said. All to protect my cousin here. Hinata was the next one to speak. Half of my family are treated like slaves by the other half, her eyes were downcast. And I am looked down upon by that half because they think I am weak and too nice. When I was five, I was almost kidnapped by a rival village so they could start a new generation of Hyuga. We have a friend back in Kanoha, Sasuke said. Who, until recently, had a literal demon in her mind. It tormented her day and night for her whole life. It threatened to take her mind, body, and soul, leaving her as nothing more than a withered-out husk. That was when Naruto retook the reins of the conversation. And me, he said. Until I was five, I had a shit life. My parents died on the day I was born. Before I was taken in by Hyuga, my village treated me like a pariah for something I could not control. Even today, there are still people who mock and fear me. Then he pointed to his empty eye sockets. And the only reason why the Hyuga took me in the first place is because of a debt they owe me, he continued. And to get that debt, I had to stop a man from taking one girl. That man beat me and took my eyes. During the speech, Naruto walked up to Inari. The boy was on the verge of tears, snort coming down from his nose. Naruto continued to glare at him. I won't make light of what you're going through here. But if you think you're the only one suffering, you have another thing coming, brat. There are people out there who have it worse than you do. Be thankful for what you have, he pointed at Tazuna and Tsunami. You still have your grandfather and your mother. That's a whole lot better than most people. Then Naruto started to walk past the boy. Naruto, where are you going? Shursue asked. Naruto stopped at the doorframe. Out for some training, he said. I need to blow off some steam, then he left. Shursue sighed as he saw Naruto retreat past the door. Just be careful out there. He said quietly. Tazuna's daughter turned over to look at Shursue. Tears were streaming down her eyes. Tell me, she said. Is it all true? Did all those things happen? Did? She glanced over at where Naruto had been. Shursue nodded. All of it, he said. Albeit it was the bare bones of what all happened, he leaned back into his chair. The members of my team have been through some traumatic stuff, that was putting it mildly. Shursue looked over to see how the kid was doing. 
He was gone and must have run out of the room while Shursway talked to his mother. I'm sorry, she said. We didn't know. Shursway nodded. It's okay, he said. But if I may ask, how did Inari get like that? It doesn't feel like Gato taking over this country alone would have been enough to put him in that state, the same went for the rest of the town close by. Gato had done something to so thoroughly break the spirits of the people here. Tazuna and his daughter looked down at the table. Then they looked at each holding a silent conversation. After a moment, Tsunami looked at Shursue. It has to do with Inari's father, she said. So, she went into an explanation about Inari's father, or the man that would become his father, Kaisa. She explained how he first came to Wave Country and had saved a younger Inari from drowning. From then on, Kiaza had become both a father figure and a role model for the boy. He had single-handedly saved the nearby town from a flood at one point. From that day, Kiaza had become a hero to many, especially to Inari. Then Gato came and took over the country. Kiaza had been the first one to stand up to the businessman. From what Tsunami could tell them, the man managed to put up an impressive fight before Gato's men subdued him. Then, she came to the end of Kiaza's story. Angered by his defiance, Gato had Kiaza executed in front of the whole town, including Inari. And so, the hero of Wave was killed, Shursue said to sum up the story. And Inari and the rest of the town have been left in a broken state since then. Inari's mother nodded. I'm sorry about him, she said. He used to be a happy boy. But since Kiaza's death, he's lost all hope. Kiba snort. Still doesn't give him the right to whine like a brat about it, he said. Kiba. Sakura admonished her teammate. What? Kiba said, looking at Sakura. It's true. Sakura shook her head. You still shouldn't have said it, she said, then a worried expression spread across her. She looked over at Shursue. Uh, Shursue sensei, do you think Naruto is going to be all right? Should someone check on him? To everyone's surprise, it was Hinata who answered the question. No, she said, shaking her head. He wants to be alone. We shouldn't disturb him. Sakura gave the Hyuga girl a questioning look. Are you sure? she asked. And how do you know that? Hinata started to blush and pressed her fingers together. I, I just do, she said. I know Naruto. A sly smile crossed Kiba's face. Oh, I. Know how you know, he said. We all do. Hinata's blush deepened. Kiba's smirk grew, and then he jumped out of his chair. Ow! What was that for? He said, glaring at Sakura, who had a pleased look on her face. Shursue could not keep the smile off his face as he sighed. All right, you too, he said. Behave. We'll worry about Naruto in the morning. Until then, I want you all to get some rest. Understood? Hi sensei. Shursue nodded. Good, then he looked at his other genin students. Sasuke and Hinata, if and when Naruto gets back. Tell him we'll be having a team meeting. I need to discuss something with the three of you, they nodded at him. Sakura was wandering through the halls when she heard what sounded like crying. It was faint, to the point that Sakura might have missed it if not for the fact she was taking her time. She had a lot on her mind that night. Sakura traced the noise back to a nearby sliding door. She slid open and looked down. There sitting on the porch with his knees tucked into his chest. Was Inari, the little boy who had gotten a raise out of Naruto. He was holding on to what looked like a photo. Sakura paused at the door, wondering what she should do. Should she try to console the boy, or would it be better to leave him alone? Then she remembers what she saw back in the nearby town, the suffering she and her friends saw. And she remembers how powerless she felt for being unable to help them. Taking a breath, Sakura brushed a stray strand of hair back into place. 
She walked out and closed the door behind her quietly so as not to startle the boy. Carefully, she slid next to the crying Inari and stared at him. She would wait until the boy noticed her. She didn't have to wait long as the boy suddenly tensed up, slowly turning his head to look at her. A confused expression spreads across his face, still puffy with tears. What are you doing out here? He asked. Sakura smiled at the boy. Nothing too much, she said. I was walking by when I heard something. So, I came to check on it. Oh, Inari said, looking down at the ground. I'm sorry. I can go away if you like. For a moment, Sakura's smile felt strained. No, don't, she said quickly. You can stay here and talk to me if you want. The boy gave her a wary expression. She could understand how he felt. She was a total stranger asking him how he felt. Sakura's eyes wandered over to the photo in Inari's hand. On close examination, she saw it was a photo of him, his mother, his grandfather, and a man she didn't recognize. A hunch formed in her mind. That's a nice photo you got there, she said. Inari looked confused for a second before he realized what Sakura was talking about. He looked at the photo. Um, thanks? He responded. Sakura scooted closer to Inari. Is that him? She asked, pointing to the man in the photo. Your father, I mean. Kiaza. The boy looked at her in surprise. How did you? He started to ask. Your mother told us, she. Answered. She told us about him a little bit after you left. How he came to wave, what he did for you and this country, and what Gato did to him, it was one of the saddest tales she had heard. Inari stared at the photo in his hands, new tears coming down from his eyes. He was my hero, he said after a moment. But then he died. Heroes aren't supposed to die. Reflexively, Sakura almost agreed with the boy. Heroes were not supposed to die. Then she remembered her history lessons and had to ask herself a question. How many of Kanoha's heroes had lived to an old age? Sakura did not like the answer she came up with. Before she could think further on the subject, Inari asked her a question. Is it true? Sakura blinked and looked at the boy. What is true? She asked. What he said, Inari said. What your friend said. About everything that happened in your home village. About what happened to him. Is it all true? Ah. Uh. Now Sakura understood where Inari was coming from. The pink-haired girl let out a breath and got herself comfortable on the porch. For a moment, she wonders how best to answer the boy's question. She decided that the simple approach was the best way. Yeah, she said softly. It's all true, it wasn't anything she liked to think about a lot. They were reminders that her home was not as safe as she would like to believe it was. Naruto, Hinata, Sasuke, and Yakumo, that's the other girl mentioned. They all suffered in one way or another. Inari remained silent as he stared at the photo in his hands. But what about him? He asked. Sakura had a distinct idea of who he was talking about. Doesn't he regret what happened? Does he regret becoming a? A? The boy trailed off, unable to say the word. A hero, you mean? Sakura finished for him. She brushed her hand through her hair. I don't think he really does view himself as a hero. But even if he does, I don't think he regrets saving Hinata for a second. If he were to do it again, even knowing what would happen, he would. Just like I think your father would. Inari looked at her, shocked. He would. A sad smile spread across Sakura's face. Yes, I think he would, she answered. Inari, she trailed off, wondering how best to explain this to him. It was something she barely understood herself and had just come to the conclusion. Heroes don't always get their happy endings. A lot of times, they die protecting what they love. 
So, being a hero is a death sentence, Inari said bitterly. Sakura laid her hand on Inari's shoulder, startling him. That's not what I'm saying, she said. I think you think too much about how he died and not enough about how he lived. How he lived? Inari questioned. Sakura nodded. Your father, Kiaza. He helped people, is that right? She got a nod from the boy. When he saw someone was in trouble, he went out of his way to help them. Is that correct? He even saved you when he could have gone about his own business. Inari silently nodded. H he did, the boy said. The small smile inching across his face. And he saved this town by closing that floodgate, Sakura said. And he was a hero when he went up against the gato. But he died, Inari said. But he lived as a hero, Sakura countered. Back in my home, some of our greatest heroes died defending the village. They died for what they believed in. Just like your father did. A hero is not someone who will live at the end of the day, not always. But they are those who would give their lives for others. So, they can go on. Sakura looked up at the night sky. Inari, I know I have no right to say this, she said. I've never suffered anything in my life. I don't know what it's like to face hardship like you and the rest of the people of Wave. Or like some of my friends, truthfully, she felt that maybe it would be better if Naruto, Hinata, Sasuke, or even Yakumo were here to tell him this. But they all moved on, she added. She looked back at the boy, seeing him frown at her. So, what you saying is I should forget all about it? He asked. There was an edge in his voice. Sakura shook her head. No, never, she said quickly. Then she took a breath. I'm not saying that you should forget. I said that my friends had moved on, but they never forgot the hardships they faced. I think they will always carry them with them, but they will never let them drag them down. Inari remained silent for a long time as he looked up at the sky. But it's so hard, he said. Maybe, Sakura said, looking up at the sky again. But you also have what all my friends had when facing hardships. They had help from people who understood what they were going through. Like you do now. Inari looked at her, surprised. I do? he asked. Sakura nodded. You do, she said. You have your mother and your grandfather. They are both going through the same thing. They can help if you let them. They're your family. Inari looked away from her and at the photo. My family, he said. They're suffering like I am. They are, Sakura said. She could see it. Inari's mother tried to hide it, and his grandfather buried it under his drinking. But even someone like Sakura could tell that they were hurting. Sakura stood up. If there is one thing I learned from my friends, she said. Is that you are never alone. Even in the hardest of times, there will be someone there for you, she looked at Inari and smiled at him. Inari, your father was a hero. I don't think he would want you to dwell on his death like this. I think he would want to live by the lessons he taught while he was alive. Then she turned around and went for the door. Sliding it open, she stood at the doorframe. Good night, Inari, she said. Try not to stay up too late, then she slides the door behind her. She almost jumped when Kurinai spoke to her. You spoke well, she was by the wall. Sakura felt herself blushing. I just wanted to help, she said. I'm not even sure what I said will have any effect on him. Kurinai smiled at her. It will, she said. You said what he needed to hear. Sakura nodded. I think, she said carefully. I think I'll go to bed now. I'm feeling a little tired. Kurinai gave her an understanding look. It has been a long day for all of us, she said. Get some rest. Sakura paused for a moment. What are you going to do? Kurinai looked over at the door. I'm going to wait a moment, she said. 
then have a talk with Inari. See how he is holding up. Sakura nodded. Good night, sensei, she said. Good night, Sakura. Sakura wasn't sure how much sleep she would get tonight. She had a lot to think about. Sitting alone in his room, Shursui pulled out a scroll. His genin didn't know it yet, but they had additional orders other than reinforcing Team 8. He pulled the scroll open and reread the contents. Additional orders for Team 11 during their current mission. In addition to reinforcing the members of Kanoha Genin Cell Team 8, the members of Kanoha Genin Cell Team 11, under the command of Jonin Uchiha Shursui, are to execute the following objects upon arrival to the Land of Waves. Scout the area and identify all assets belonging to or claimed by Gato Shipping. Obtain and confirm evidence of misdeeds perpetrated by employees and other hired personnel of Gato Shipping. Identify the individual known as Gato of Gato Shipping. If identified, proceed with additional orders below. If not identified, return to Kanoha upon completion of Kanoha Genin Cell Teammates mission. Assassinate Gato. The severed head will serve as proof of mission completion. Genin Cell Team 11 as until the completion of Genin Cell Teammates mission, to complete all objects. Signed Sarutobi Hiruzen, Sandame Hokage. Shursui sighed. His team had their first assassination mission. He hoped his genin were up to it. Wave Haku had not expected to meet anyone while she was out. Least of all, one of the genin from the Kanohanin. The young woman had left her master's bedside to collect medicinal herbs to help with his recovery. She had collected a good haul, enough to help her master with enough left over for emergencies, which were more frequent than she would like, as her master loved to get into fights. Haku was about to leave and return to the hideout when she saw a figure lying in the meadow. To indulge her curiosity, Haku chose to investigate the figure. Imagine her surprise when she saw the figure was one of the Kanohanin. A boy a few years younger than her. He had blonde hair and a headband with orange cloth wrapped around his eyes. A blind shinobi, Haku thought. She had never met one but had heard stories from Zabuza about his encounters with some. He had explicitly warned her against underestimating a shinobi who was blind. Or any shinobi that had a disability, for if they were skilled enough to overcome their disability, it meant they were extremely dangerous opponents. With her master's warning in mind, Haku carefully approached the boy. He was sprawled out on the ground, dirt covered his clothes. He must have been out training last night. Haku concluded. She knelt beside the boy, getting a closer look at him. Aside from his blindfold, he didn't appear to be all that remarkable. The only other distinguishing feature he had was the whisker marks on his face. A clan trait, perhaps? Haku reached her hand out for the boy's neck. It would be so easy to finish him off here and now. He was asleep and unlikely to sense anything. One flick of her wrist and the boy's neck would be snapped. A quick and painless death. It would be one less concern for her and her master. Hey, wake up, she said, tapping the boy on the head. Internally, she cursed herself for her soft heart. Or else you'll catch a cold. The boy woke up with a start. W.H. Watt? The boy shot up to a sitting position. He looked around the meadow, not that it would do him any good. What happened? Where? Then he faced Haku. Who are you? Haku lowered her hand and let out a sigh. No one important, she said. I was just passing by when I saw you. The boy's head tilted to the side. Passing by? He said. For some strange reason, Haku had the impression that he was looking at the basket full of herbs. Yes, Haku confirmed. I was on the way back home from collecting herbs. Then I found you sleeping out in the middle of this field. Oh, right, the boy said, chuckling and scratching the back of his head. I guess I was out pretty late last night. If I might ask, Haku said. What were you doing out here? 
Oh, that, the boy said. I was out training last night, and I guess I lost track of time. I imagine my friends are worried about me. Your friends? Haku asked. This seemed like a good chance to learn more about her enemy. The boy nodded. Yeah, he said. Then, a smile crossed his face. Well, it might be more accurate to call them my teammates, he pointed to the headband covering his eyes. If you haven't noticed, I'm a shinobi. Haku smiled and let out a little giggle. Then you must be strong, she said, getting comfortable. She knew this boy was her enemy, but she couldn't help but feel a sense of ease around him. Perhaps if circumstances were different, they would be friends. The boy giggled as he rubbed the back of his head. I guess I am, he boasted. His chest puffed out in pride. Haku almost rolled her eyes at the action. But I know I'm not the strongest in my village. This surprised Haku. She had expected the boy to act more boastful. Really now? You seem plenty strong to me, she dug to see what the blindfolded boy would say. His smile dimmed. There are lots of people stronger than me, he said. My sensei, the Hokage, really anyone who isn't a genin. And even then, I can think of few who are better than me, Haku conceded that point. So, the boy wasn't completely full of himself. Hell, my teammate, who is also one of my best friends. His brother is super strong. Like crazy strong. Haku looked at the boy expectantly. Really now, she said. If what the boy said was true, she would have to warn Zabuza. The boy nodded, yeah, they call him the prodigy of the Uchiha clan, he said. For a moment, Haku felt herself stiffen. That description rang a bell in the back of her mind for some reason. She regained her composure and filed the thought away for later. She would have to ask Zabuza. So, yeah, I'm far from the strongest in my village. Then, the boy looked up at the morning sky. But one day, I want to be, he said. One day, I will be the strongest shinobi in my village. Then I will be Hokage. The boy reached his hand out and grasped at the air. Haku smiled at the boy. What's your name? she asked. The boy looked at her, confused for a second. Oh, that's right, I never told who I am, he said. If Sarah were here, she'd probably hit me over the head for being rude. Sarah? Haku said, raising an eyebrow. My caretaker, the boy explained. Don't tell her I said this, but I think of her more like an older sister. My lips are sealed, Haku responded. The boy nodded at her. So anyway, I'm Uzumaki Naruto, the now named Naruto reached his hand out. Nice to meet you. Haku took Naruto's hand and shook it. Haku, she introduced herself. So, tell me, Naruto, why do you want to become so strong? You mentioned that you wanted to become the Hokage of your village, right? Naruto nodded. I do, he said. It's been my dream ever since I was a kid, Haku decided not to comment that technically he was still a kid. Why is that? Haku asked. Is the Hokage the leader of your village or something? He is, Naruto said. And so much more than that. He's the strongest shinobi in our village, and he's loved by everyone. Well, almost everyone. So, it's the recognition you seek, she said. A part of her understood that reasoning. That's a part of it, Naruto said. When I was young, I didn't have an easy life. For reasons that I couldn't understand at the time and that were beyond my control, the people of my village didn't like me all that much. In fact, I could count on my hand the number of people who cared about me and with fingers to spare. The rest of the village, a dark expression spreads across his face. They just ignored my existence. Haku felt a tug at her heart. The boy didn't have to give her details. She understood what he went through. Kiri was not a kind place for people like her. So, in this regard, she felt a kinship with the boy. 
that was not a good thing. I think I understand, Haku said after a moment. She looked out across the meadow as memories came back to her. Naruto looked at her. You do? He asked. Haku nodded, even though it was a useless gesture. Somehow, she got the impression he would understand. Her suspicions were confirmed when she saw the boy nodding. The Hokage was one of the people who cared about me. He knew who my parents were. I see, Haku said. So, meeting this man made you want to be like him? Another feeling she was familiar with. Yeah, something like that, Naruto said. The Sandame is so wise and caring, the village loves him. Growing up the way I did back then, I wanted that. I wanted the acknowledgement of the village, I wanted the people to see that I existed. I guess at the time, being the Hokage was the best way to do that. Haku smiled at the boy. Is that it? She asked. The only reason you want to be the leader of your village is to be acknowledged. Is it the same reason why you became a shinobi? Naruto shook his head. No, he said. A part of me still wants that. But I have other reasons driving me toward my dream. An intrigued expression spread across Haku's face. Was it possible that this boy knew? And what is that? To protect the people I care about, Naruto said, smiling at Haku. Then he went into an explanation about his village's will of fire. By the end of it, Haku was deep in thought. That is an interesting view, Haku said. She was looking out across the field. Some would even call it strange. Naruto shook his head. I don't think so, he said. I want to be strong, he held his arm out and closed his hand into a fist. Strong enough to defend the village. Strong enough to protect the people I care about. Then his hand went for his headband. And strong enough not to fail again. Haku didn't have to ask him what he meant by that last statement, she could make a reasonable assumption. It would explain the headband covering his eyes. Haku stood up and collected her basket of herbs. Then I think you won't have much to worry about, she said. I believe you are well on your way to being strong. Naruto smiled at her. Thanks, he said. Uh, do you need help with that? Haku shook her head. No, but thank you, she said. This will of fire of yours, she brushed away a stray hair. I have to say that I'm not one of those people who think it's strange. In fact, I agree with the principles behind it. Naruto looked at her strangely. You do? He asked. Haku nodded and smiled. I have always believed that one is truly strong when they have someone precious to protect, for her, that would always be Zabuza. Naruto's head tilted down like he was looking out across the meadow. Then that's something we can both agree on, he said. It was nice meeting you, miss. Haku bowed her head to the Kanoha shinobi. The pleasure was all mine, she said. Then, a mischievous expression spreads across her face. Oh, and by the way, I'm a boy. She never got to see the expression on the blonde's face as she left. It took Naruto a moment to recover from Haku's declaration. Do you really think she's a boy? Not for a second, Kurama said. Remember, I have access to all your senses. Her scent clearly marks her as female. Right, Naruto said. We need to work on my other senses. Agreed, Kurama replied. But you can see why she might lie about that. Naruto nodded. He had seen enough of Gato's men to see why Haku might want to conceal her gender. Considering what he saw the other day, even pretending to be a boy might not be enough to protect her. She was nice, though, wasn't she? Naruto commented. He got a mental image of Kurama nodding. It's too bad we may have to fight her in the next few days. Naruto had been aware of who the girl was from the beginning. Even while he slept, his eyes had seen the young woman entering the meadow and watched as she picked herbs. Naruto guessed they were for Zabuza. 
It was when Haku started to approach him that Kurama woke him up. Naruto instantly recognized her and was ready to counter any action she would take. He was about to spring into action when her hand reached his throat. But then she stopped and woke him up. I didn't pick anything up from her, Naruto said to Kurama. She seemed genuine. What about you, Kurama? Did you get anything from her? I felt no ill intent from the girl, Kurama said. She had no intention of harming you. Even when she reached for your throat, I felt no malice. Naruto frowned at that comment from the fox. What are you saying? He asked. That's she some kind of psychopath? From within the seal, Kurama shook his head. Not at all, he replied. She never had any intention of hurting you, even if she wasn't aware of that. But you already knew that, didn't you? Naruto remained silent as he thought about Kurama's words and continued to watch Haku walk back to her hideout. His conversation with her confirmed what he could already see on her face. Haku was a kind, gentle soul. For a moment, he had to wonder how someone like her became a shinobi and one under the command of Zabuza. Naruto stood up and stretched his body out. Then again, I could ask the same thing about Hinata, he thought. Come on, Kurama, he said aloud. Let's get back to the others and tell them what's going on. Deep down, Naruto hoped that he wouldn't be the one to face Haku. Tazuna's house Shursui had a hand on his chin when Naruto had finished relaying what happened in the meadow. I see, he said with an even expression. So, you made contact with the enemy all by yourself. That was risky, Naruto, very risky. What if she had tried to kill you? Naruto shrugged his shoulders. The others in the room were giving him worried expressions. It's not like I had a choice, he said to defend himself. She spotted me while I was out. I'm glad that Kurama warned me. Shursui nodded. Still, you could have gotten yourself out of there without risking yourself, he said. But it does give us some insight into our enemy, Naruto winced at the term his sensei chose to use. So, I suppose that the risk was worth it. Kiba looked confused. So, what does it tell us about her? He asked. She's still our enemy, right? What else do we need to know? Naruto wanted to refute what Kiba said. She's not just an enemy, he thought. But Shursui beat him. To the punch. Things are not always that clear-cut, he said. In our line of work, we don't always have the luxury of making clear lines between friend and foe. Kurinai nodded and walked up to her genin. By now, she had recovered enough not to need crutches anymore. There are times when you will have to face people who in another time you would have considered a friend, she said. Likewise, on some missions, you will have to work with people who you despise. But Gato and his men are evil, Sakura said. And Zabuza didn't appear to be a nice person. So, why would this Haku girl be working for them? Kurinai said. As Shursui said, Things aren't always so clear-cut, she explained. We don't know what in her life happened that led her here. Naruto was silent as he thought about that. He had a rough idea of what might have happened with Haku, which led her to Zabuza's services. Still, it is something to keep in mind, Shursui said. But we do have to keep in mind that her mission is to kill our client. Even if she is someone some of us might consider a friend, we still have to treat her like an enemy. Is that understood, Naruto? Naruto was silent for a moment. He nodded. Hi, sensei, he said. Shursui nodded. Then he looked at Kurinai. Kurinai, he addressed the other jonin in the room. Can you take your team out to protect Tazuna? There's something I need to discuss with my team. Kurinai nodded. It was our mission originally, she said. We should be able to handle it. Besides, Zabuza won't show up for a couple of more days. Still, be careful out there, he said. Kurinai smiled and nodded. We will, she said. Then she and her team left. 
With only the members of Team 11 left, Shursui looked at Naruto with an even expression. Before I go into detail on our actual mission, he started. There is something I have to ask you, Naruto. Naruto knew what he would ask him. Like if whether or not I can face Haku down, he said. I mean, she is an enemy shinobi, right? So, I should be able to face her, no problem. Shursui frowned. But she's not just an enemy shinobi, he said. It's not like that time with the nuke Nin. They were trying to kill you and your friends. She hasn't. It's more than that, Shursui sensei Naruto said. A confused expression crossed the faces of Hinata and Sasuke. What do you mean? Sasuke asked. Is there something about her you haven't told us? Hinata asked. Naruto remained silent as he thought back to his conversation. The expression on Haku's face when Naruto explained his life before the Hyuga took him in. It was painful, but not in the sense she was sympathizing. But that she understood what he felt. I think, Naruto started. I think she's a lot like us. Hinata and Sasuke exchanged glances. How so? Sasuke asked. She's been through hardship, Naruto said. She knows what it's like to have her whole life turned upside down. I don't think she had an easy life. But I don't think she ever had anyone to help her through them. Except for Zabuza, Hinata pointed out. I hesitate to call him anyone who would help her, Sasuke said dryly. Naruto had a frown on his face as he looked at his sensei. Shursui gave him a look that said the same thought had passed through his mind. You never know, Shursui said with a shrug of his shoulders. As I said earlier, we shinobi don't always get to draw lines between friends and enemies. While I can't agree with their goals, the truth is Zabuza and this Haku girl have a mission. And so do we. So, I will ask this question once, Naruto, will you be able to face Haku down in a fight if it comes to it? Naruto was quiet for a very long time. It's not fair, Naruto thought. He had met someone outside of the village who might be able to be considered a friend. Someone who might be a lot like him. Now, he was facing the possibility that he would have to fight them, quite possibly to the death. That is life, Kurama said. You think I asked to be sealed away like this? Aside from the day you were born, I have not wandered the lands freely for more than a hundred years. Naruto frowned. And I never asked for you to be sealed in me. Or for the way people treat me because of it, he said to the fox. He partially regretted his words. Inside the seal, Kurama nodded his head and lay down. Life is not always fair, he said. It is what we do with that unfairness is what matters. For me, I am an immortal being, I can live with whatever happens. What will you do? He closed his eyes, intending to get some sleep. Naruto was silent for a moment after that. Then he looked at Shursui. I really don't know, he said honestly. I never had to face someone like her before. So, I can't say if I can face her. I guess we'll find out if it comes to it. Hinata was giving him a worried expression. Sasuke also had a look of worry in his eyes, but he hid it with a smirk. Don't worry, he said haughtily. If you get too scared, I can take her on for you. To think the great Uzumaki Naruto would be too scared to face a girl. Naruto frowned and glared at Sasuke. You do remember that Hinata is standing right next to you, right? He asked. Sasuke turned around to face said girl, who gave him a sweet smile. Sasuke paled and faced Naruto. Not what I meant, he said. Shursui snorted and shook his head. Not the answer I was hoping to hear, he said, looking at Naruto. But not unexpected. Luckily, if all goes according to plan, you may not have to face her. The genin looked at Shursui, confused. How come? Naruto asked. If there were a way to avoid fighting Haku and Zabuza, he would take it. 
When we complete our mission, Shursui answered, pulling a scroll out. Our real mission here. He tossed the scroll over to the genin. Naruto caught the scroll and opened it up. A pair of his eyes settled over the scroll so he could read it. Hinata and Sasuke stood on either side of him close enough so they could also read. A frown appeared on Naruto's face as he read the mission details, but he kept his thoughts to himself until he reached the end. Then he reread it twice more. He exchanged glances with Hinata and Sasuke to see what their reactions would be like. Aside from some frowns, their expressions showed nothing. Once they nodded, he rolled the scroll up and tossed it back to Shursui. Any questions? Shursui asked, pocketing the scroll. Why didn't you tell us sooner? Sasuke asked. Naruto nodded and added his own question. Why does the Hokage want Gato dead? Shursui nodded. I was told to wait a few days before I gave you guys our real mission, he explained. Something about establishing a cover. But I think the Sandame wanted to give you guys a chance to settle into the mission before I dropped this one on you. Shursui took a seat in a nearby chair. As for why the Hokage wants him dead, Shursui puts a hand to his chin. Gato has been known for his misdeeds by Kanoha for some time now. But we never had the opportunity to deal with him until now. The genin nodded, understanding why they were being asked to do this now. So, this is going to be our first assassination mission, Sasuke said. It feels weird. I can't say I feel sorry for the man or that he doesn't deserve it. But we're still killing someone. Naruto felt the same way. It wasn't quite the same when they killed the bandits. In that sense, they had some excuse for self-defense. But with Gato, they had expressed orders from the Hokage to kill the man. It felt weird and jarred with Naruto's image of the old Hokage. A kind, wise old man who had a grandfatherly smile on his face. It didn't mesh well with someone who would coldly order the death of another person. Shursui crossed his arms and nodded. That I can understand, he said. I had hoped to push your first mission like this off for a while longer. Especially after getting your first kills like you did. But that has been taken out of my hands. So, do you guys think you're up to it? The genin looked at themselves. They were silently asking the same question. Could they do this? Kill a man in cold blood, never seeing who had sent him to the afterlife. The three of them hesitate for a moment. Then, each of them remembered what they had seen of Wave. The poor, starving people in the streets. The way Gato's thugs treated the people and walked through town like they owned the place. Naruto remembers the things he saw in Gato's hideout. The women and children huddled together near the bottle of the building. Naruto felt his hands ball into fists. He already knows his answer. Looking between his teammates, he could see they had also reached a decision. All three genin nodded at their sensei. Shursui had an expressionless look on his face as he stared at his team. He nodded. All right then, he said. We'll proceed with the mission. So, do we go in now and take the bastard's head? Sasuke asked. Shursui shook his head. Not right. Now, he said. We'll have to scout Gato's hideout some more before we can make a move on his life. Not to mention, the place will be too well guarded with Zabuza and Haku there. No, we'll have to wait for the right moment. Hinata seemed to realize what that time would be like. We're going to wait for Zabuza to recover first, aren't we? She asked. And let him attack Tazuna. Sasuke looked at Shursui while Naruto kept his head facing the wall. Does Karinai and her team know? Naruto asked. Shursui uncrossed his arms. Karinai, yes, he replied. I discussed it with her the other night, and we decided this was the best course of action. But her team doesn't know about our plan. Will we tell them? Hinata asked. Shursui shook his head. We don't want to risk tipping Zabuza and Haku off that something might be up. 
the fact that we won't be there during the battle will be enough to keep them alert. The plan is to lure the two out on the bridge, where Team 8 will engage them. In the meantime, we'll carry out our assassination of Gato. Shursue stood up and walked up to his genin. With Gato out of the picture, Zabuza and Haku will have no reason to continue their mission. No client means no pay. Sasuke frowned. What if they still try to complete their mission even if Gato is dead, he asked. I doubt they will, Shursue said. Zabuza does not come off as the type of shinobi who would try to avenge a dead client. Let alone complete a mission for one. Not unless Gato has something sat up in the event he is killed. But I doubt he has the foresight for something like that. So, we take Gato out, and we don't have to worry about Zabuza and Haku anymore, Naruto said. He wouldn't say it, but he felt a little relieved by that. The plan still hinges on Team 8 being able to occupy them long enough for us to assassinate Gato. But yes, Shursue replied. But in the meantime, we'll have to scout out his hideout. We need to have some idea of what the patrol schedules around the place are like. What paths do they follow? What times do the guards change out? Stuff like that. The genin nodded. There might even be hidden ways in or out, Sasuke said. Exactly, Shursue said. Then Shursue turned his attention to Naruto. Naruto, when we do kill Gato, we'll need to bring back proof. How good have you gotten with your Fuenjutsu? Naruto nodded. I should have something ready by that time, he said. He would need to modify one of their storage scrolls. Adding a stasis element to it would be tricky but Naruto was confident in his ability. Good, Shursue said. You don't have to do anything fancy. We'll just be taking his head. Naruto nodded, relieved that he wouldn't have to modify the scroll to hold a whole human body. Even one as small as Gato's. Now then, do any of you have questions? Shursue looked at each of the genin in the room. None of them had anything to ask. Then, in that case, let's figure out a plan on how we're going to assassinate. Gato. In the next room, a young boy slides down the wall. For the first time he could remember, he felt something thing. Hope. The next day, Gato's hideout, just hold still, Haku said as she applied the medicine to her master's wound. Gah. Zabuza winced. Damn it, Haku. Since when did you become such a sadist? Haku rolled her eyes. It surprised her that sometimes her master could take something like a sword wound to the stomach or chest or burn marks all over his body, and he would act like it was nothing. But small stings from her medicine or other small things like that and her master acted like a big baby. It was more than a bit jarring. Just hold still, Haku repeated to herself. And this will all be over. Honestly, you are the demon of the bloody mist. Not some baby whining about getting a shot. Also, me a sadist? Isn't that the kettle calling the pot black? Zabuza rolled his eyes, still wincing as Haku continued to treat him. If you were any indication, it's no wonder people are afraid of needles, he said. Haku decided not to comment on the fact that he was one of those people. Again, it's jarring to think about. He wielded a giant meat cleaver the size of a human being but bring up the subject of needles, and he paled like a ghost. Haku sighed. Just be patient for a little longer, she said more to herself than Zabuza. I'm almost done here. Then you can go back to being the demon of the bloody mist. Zabuza snorted but let Haku continue with her work. So, when should I be ready to fight those Kanohanin? he asked. It's been five days already. I'm itching for some action. Haku examined her master's body, seeing that his wounds were almost gone. Not much longer, she said. I believe by tomorrow, you should be okay. But I would wait until the day after before you try anything. Zabuza nods. Good, he said with a grin under his face mask. 
Then we can show those Kanohanin what it means to mess with the demon of the bloody mist. Haku frowned. She never relished fighting like her master did. In fact, she hated the idea of hurting anyone. But for some reason, the thought of fighting the Kanohanin was even less appealing than usual. It's because of that boy, Haku told herself. Part of her regretted going out that day and entering that meadow. She did not regret not snapping the boy's neck when she had the chance. And she knew she would do it again, even if she knew what would happen. She hoped she would not have to face Naruto. She never noticed the strange look Zabuza was giving her. What's with you? Zabuza said with a frown. Something seems to be on your mind. Haku blushed, embarrassed that she had allowed her thoughts to be broadcast so openly. She shook her head. It's nothing, she said, recovering quickly. Nothing you need to be worried about. Zabuza looked at her like he didn't believe her. Haku opened her mouth to say something more in her defense. But a snort from the man stopped her. Whatever you say, he said, laying his head on the bed. Just get done already. Haku nodded. Yes, Zabuza-sama, she said. A few moments later, she was surprised when Zabuza spoke again. Hey, Haku, he said. When this is all over with, and we've dealt with Gato. How about we take a break for a little bit? Find somewhere to relax before we move on to our next score, a smile spreads under his face wraps. A place with a good bar. It took a moment for Haku to get over her surprise. I think that would be nice, she said, then continued to treat her master. A little vacation did sound nice. Outside Gato's hideout thousand I hear, Naruto said. They've shifted the guard again. I'm seeing the same thing here, Sasuke said. What about you, Moon Eye? And no, Hinata replied. The guards here haven't changed yet. I see, Shursui said. So that means they change the guards every couple of hours and not all at once. Red Eye, is there anything else you can, see? It looks like they're using the same guys from yesterday, Sasuke said. And they don't look all that enthusiastic about it. Naruto saw Shursui shrug his shoulders. Well, we shouldn't expect discipline like a Samari from these thugs. They're just hired goons. Once Gato is gone, they'll scatter. Naruto nodded, he saw the others doing the same. What if the thugs try something when they realize their boss is dead? He asks. With Sabuza, they were expecting some form of professionalism from him. The thugs on Gato's payroll were a different matter. That is a possibility, Shursui said. And one will have to be prepared for. Thousand Eye, what can you see inside the hideout? Still trying to map the place out, Master A, Naruto said. But from what I can see, security is way more relaxed than outside. There are hardly any patrols going around in the halls. And aside from Gato's penthouse, I haven't seen guards posted anywhere inside. The thugs are acting like, well, thugs, Naruto continued to report what he was seeing. Most of them are just goofing around. I see them eating, drinking, sleeping, and other vices, he tried to avoid certain parts of the lower areas of the hideout. Shursui nodded as he processed the information. Sounds like they never expect anyone to get in, he said. That'll work to our advantage. So, team, what can you tell of Gato and his routine? That he's a greedy pig, Sasuke comments. This got an eye roll from everyone. He likes to visit the nearby docks to check in on the shipments. Can we tell what these shipments are? Shursui asked. Sasuke shook his head. Only speculation on our part, he said. But most likely something illegal. Maybe drugs and spices. Once we're done here, we'll need to see about breaking into the docks, he said. And see if we can't get into the cargo. Now, what else do we know about him? Naruto answered this time. Once he's done checking around the docks, he likes to take a stroll around the nearby town. 
He's always surrounded by a dozen guards when he does this. He doesn't do much in town. Except look around and sneer at everyone. Nobody crosses his path, Hinata said. They either scatter or stand still and watch him walk by. The people know his routine. They do all this just moments before he arrives. After that, he returns to his hideout, Sasuke finishes the report. Any sign that he visits the bridge our client is making? Shursway asked. The genin shook their heads. Negative, Master I, Naruto answered. He appears to be giving the bridge a wide berth. I see, Shursway says. Now then, what does Gato do once he returns to the hideout? He reads reports and counts his money, Naruto said, recalling what he saw the man do yesterday and today. He also seems to like to belittle his men. After that, he retreats to his penthouse. Where his men send him food, drink, and women, the last word came out in disgust. From the perspective of his eyes, he saw Hinata stiffen slightly. How well guarded is his penthouse while he's there? Not all that well, Naruto said. He only has two guards outside his room, and they don't appear to take their job seriously. And aside from the guards and patrols outside, no one is watching the windows to his penthouse, Sasuke said. I'd say that's our best bet of getting to Gato. The others nodded. How are we going to do this? Sasuke asked. We'll figure that out when we return to Tazuna's house, Shursue said. Let's focus on scouting the hideout, then check out those docks. Naruto nodded. He still wasn't comfortable with the idea that they were planning the death of another human being. Even one as revolting as Gato was. But at the same time, he felt a growing sense of anticipation. They would free a whole country once Gato was gone. What part of it wouldn't be exciting? Lake near Tazuna's house Kiba slowly placed one foot after another, only taking another step once he was sure he had a good footing with the other. A wide smile spread across his face as his foot stayed at the top of the water. Then he took another step. Once, he was a few feet away from the shore and turned around, letting out a loud howl. All right, I finally got the hang of this thing, he said. Then, he pumped his fist into the air. So excited about his recent achievement that he, for a moment, forgot to keep his focus. With a yelp, Kiba almost found himself falling into the lake. But he managed to catch himself and regain his footing on the water's surface. That was too close, Kiba said in a deflated tone. He looked over that shore and saw his partner Akameru looking at him with a happy tail wag. The little dog barked at him. Kiba smiled back at his partner. I supposed we'll have to get you to do this next, he said to his partner. It was a night out, while the others were asleep, Kiba had snuck out to practice with the water walking exercise. Akameru tilted his head to the side and let out a confused bark. Of course, you can do it. Remember, Karamaru showed you how to walk up trees. I'm sure he can teach you how to walk across water. And I'm willing to bet that he'll get it down quicker than you, a voice said. Kiba looked over to see Naruto walking up to the shore of the lake. A fox-like grin was plastered on his face. After all, he's a smarter dog than you. Then he knelt and petted the dog in question. Kiba glared at the blindfolded boy. Watch it, fox boy, he said, pointing his finger at Naruto. I bet it took ages just to get this far over the water, he gestures to where he was over the lake. Naruto shook his head as he kept petting Akamaru. No, I got the water walking down pretty quickly, he said. Then again, I had some help from Hinata and a certain nine-tailed fox. Kiba snorted and crossed his arms. Well, not all of us have people who can see your chakra, he said. Or a ten-thousand-year-old demon fox sealed in our gut. Kiba could almost hear the refute from said demon fox. Something about not being a day over three thousand. Kiba uncrossed his arms. So, what are you doing out here, Naruto? Mostly seeing what you're doing, Naruto said. 
Kiba rolled his eyes. You can do that any time, Kiba said. You didn't need to come out here. True, Naruto admitted. But I just wanted to walk around for a little bit since I couldn't get any sleep. Then I saw you were out, so I thought that maybe chatting would be nice too, he stopped petting Akamaru, getting wind from the little dog. He stood up. I can leave if you like. Kiba shook his head. No, you can stay, he said. So as long you don't mock me again, that is. Naruto gave him a cheeky grin. Now, that will be hard, he said. After all, you make it so easy. Kiba shot Naruto with a glare. Watch it, he said, baring his claws. Naruto smiled and shook his head. So, you've known about my late night sessions? How long? Since you started, Naruto answered. A pair of eyes float around Kiba. He would have to admit as cool as the ability was, it was still sort of creepy. Remember, my eyes see many things. Kiba nodded. He supposed he should have remembered that. You haven't told anyone, have you? He asked. Naruto shook his head. I haven't, he said. Although I wouldn't be surprised if our sensei suspects something. Kiba let out a sigh. That's good, not the sensei part, but I think I can handle that, he said. Then he turned around and continued with the water walking exercise. At least without any evidence, they won't be able to stop me. Kiba looked over his shoulder to see that Naruto was giving him a questioning expression. Kiba, if you don't mind me asking, he said. Why are you training so late into the night? Kiba was quiet for a moment. In his head, he debated if he should give Naruto an honest answer or if he should find some way to dodge the question. He looked up at the night sky. Because I don't want to fall behind, he answered. He knew that Naruto was giving him an odd look. Falling behind? He heard the boy question him. Kiba looked back down at the lake, seeing his reflection. Something like that, he said. I just don't want to be the run of our little pack, he stepped around to face Naruto. All of our friends have something going for them. Sasuke and Hinata have the Sharingan and the Byakugan. Sasuke also has a prodigy of a brother to help him. You have your Futagan and Biju sealed inside of you. Yakumo can make illusions so powerful that they feel real. Shikamaru, Shino, and Sakura are super geniuses. Even Ino and Choji are amazing in their own ways. But then there's me. Aside from my clan, I don't have much else going for me. I'm not the smartest in the group, I'm not the fastest, and probably not the strongest. Hey, come on, dude, Naruto said. You don't have to sell yourself so short. You're plenty awesome. Isn't that right, Akamaru? Akamaru wigged his tail and looked at Kiba. The little dog let out a happy bark. He agreed with Naruto. Kiba smiled. You don't have to sugarcoat things for me, he said. I know that I have a lot of catching up to do. That's why I'm out here. I have to work harder so I can keep up. I don't want to let any of you down. He saw Naruto frowning. You have never let any of us down, he said. And you never will. Despite what you might think, you're more capable. You're plenty strong. Kiba let out a huff. Well, that's not going to stop me from trying to get stronger, he said. If this mission has taught us anything, is that there will always be someone better than us. Naruto nodded. True, he said. I mean, we got people like Itachi running around. Not to mention creeps like Orochimaru. That's what I'm talking about, Kiba said. There are so many more guys out there that are leagues above us. What if we run into one of them, and it comes down to me for whatever reason? What if I'm not strong enough, then? That's why I must catch up. That's why I must work so hard. Kiba, you don't have to worry about that, Naruto said. I mean, what are the odds that we'll run into any of them? 
Across the elemental nations, several very powerful shinobi sneezed all at the same time. Kiba gave Naruto a deadpan look. Naruto, he said in an even voice. Do I really need to be the one to remind you of all the shit we've seen back at the village? Naruto chuckled nervously as he placed his hands on the back of his head. Yeah, Naruto drew out. I realized at the moment I said it. But still, you're plenty strong on your own. You don't have to catch up with us. Kiba shrugged. Well, that won't stop me from trying anyway, he said. I have to get better. Naruto sighed and let his hands down. All right then, he said. Then he started to walk away. Kiba looked at Naruto. Where are you going? He asked. Naruto turned his head and smirked at him. To get some training, he said. You're not the only one who wants to get better. Kiba smiled and resumed his training. Tazuna's home Sasuke was helping Tazuna's daughter, Tsunami, clean up the dishes when the man entered the kitchen and slumped into a nearby chair. Damn those cowards, he mutters. Sasuke had a pretty good guess on what happened. Let me guess, he said, facing the man. More of your guys quit today. Tazuna snorted as he took a swing from his bottle. A bunch of cowards, the lot of them, he said. I don't need any of them. I can build the whole bridge all by myself if I have to. While Sasuke was not going to argue with that logic, he didn't want the client to overwork himself. You can't really blame them, can you, he said. Gato's men have been threatening a lot of your workers lately. Again, Tazuna snorted. Yeah, whatever, he said, he drank down on his bottle. He placed the bottle on the table with a loud thud. Sasuke was surprised it didn't break. I say they're a bunch of good-for-nothings. Gato has threatened me plenty, even sent a kami damn shinobi after me, and I'm still working on this bridge. That wasn't something that Sasuke could deny despite all the man's flaws, being a bit of a jerk and a drunk. Tazuna was a very brave man for going against Gato by building his bridge. In that regard, Sasuke had some respect for the man. Still, you can't expect everyone to be as brave as you. Tazuna looked at him with a calculating look. Me brave? he questioned. Then, let us snort. Don't kid yourself, kid. I'm not brave at all. Just about pissed myself when that Zabuza guy came after us. No, I'm not brave at all. I'm just a guy doing what he needs to do for his family. Sasuke looked at Tazuna with a raised eyebrow. I thought the bridge was for your country, he said. Tazuna smiled. It is, he said. But at the end of the day, I am doing this for my family. I want my grandson to have a better future and my daughter to find happiness. If what I'm doing helps others, he shrugged. Well, then, that's just a happy coincidence. He stood up, grabbing his bottle of alcohol. That's why it's so important to build this bridge of mine, he said. It will give all of us a better future. Then he walked off. Sasuke looked at the man's daughter. Has he always been like this? The woman stopped doing the dishes. He used to be better, she said with a smile. He didn't drink as much and wasn't quite the pessimistic he is now. But ever since Kazi died, he has had this drive to free our country from Gato. Sasuke nodded. Sounds like this Kazi guy was quite the man, he said. I would have liked to have met him. The woman smiled and turned back to her dishes. I'll finish the rest of these tonight, she said. You go ahead and get some rest. I have the feeling that you have a big day coming up soon. Sasuke looked at the woman questioningly. You sure, he asked. She nodded at him. I appreciate your help, she said. I can finish the rest. Sasuke nodded. Let us. No if you need anything, he said. He left the room. He was about to go up the stairs when Sasuke stopped. Without turning around, he said, I know you're there, he addressed the hidden presence. 
he heard a squeak of surprise from the boy by the stairs. Inari stepped out into view. How did you know I was there? he asked. Sasuke turned around and smirked at the boy. You forget I'm a shinobi, he said. I'm trained for stuff like this. You'll have to try harder than that if you want to sneak up on us. Inari looked a little put off by Sasuke's statement. Still, he stood around by the Uchiha boy. Sasuke gave the boy a critical eye. So, what is it you want? he asked the young boy as he sat down on the stairs. Inari looked pensive, like he wasn't sure if he wanted to talk. Sasuke frowned at the boy. Look, if you don't want to talk about it, he started. Just remember you're the one that tried to sneak up on me and my friends. Sasuke got up from the stairs. Inari's eyes widened, and he reached out to Sasuke. Wait, he said in a panic. Sasuke stopped looking at the boy with interest. Well, he asked, crossing his arms. Inari looked down at his feet. Sasuke saw the boy's hands ball up into fists. I heard you're trying to kill Gato, he said. Sasuke masked his surprise at hearing that. This kid must have overheard us at some point, was his thoughts. That's right, he said, sitting back on the stairs. They were orders from our Hokage, our village leader. I guess Gato must have pissed off someone. But what makes you think you can kill him? Inari looked up at Sasuke. He's so strong. There's no way anyone can kill him. Sasuke shook his head. No, he's not, he said. Gato is a coward hiding behind an army of thugs. Without them, he's nothing. Even a brat like you can put a knife in his chest. But. Inari tried to get a counter in. Sasuke stood up and walked up to the boy. Let me show you something, he said. He walked past the boy and up to the house's front door. He opened the door. He looked back at Inari and gestured for the boy to follow him. Come on, I'm not going to hurt you. Inari looked at him hesitantly but nodded his head after a moment. He followed Sasuke out the door. The two walked outside for a bit, distancing themselves from the house. Where are we going? Inari asked, looking around. Just a little bit further, Sasuke said. He looked up, noticing storm clouds above them. A faint echo of thunder could be heard. I don't want to accidentally set your house on fire. What? Inari yelped in surprise. You'll see, Sasuke said with a smirk. This should be good, he stopped suddenly. Now watch closely, he went through a series of hand signs. On the last sign, the Uchiha took a deep breath. Katan, great fireball no jutsu. Then he breathed out, letting out a stream of fire from his mouth. The stream formed into a large fireball that glided through the air and impacted the ground several feet away. When Sasuke was done breathing fire, he turned to face a stunned Inari. Sasuke smirked. Now tell me, he said, getting the boy's attention. Can Gato or any of his men do that? The stunned silence from Inari was answer enough for Sasuke. Gato is a weak coward hiding behind an army, Sasuke said, walking up to the boy. And it's not even a good one. The Jonin senseis we have with us they alone could handle all of Gato's thugs. The only threat is the two shinobi he hired. Inari tore his gaze from the burning fire several feet away. Can you beat them? He asked. Can you really kill Gato? It was at this time that the first droplets of rain started to pour down. Sasuke smirked and walked past the boy. He placed a hand on Inari's shoulder as he passed by. Gato's days are numbered. Then he left the boy in the rain. Gato's hideout, are you ready, Haku? Zabuza asked. He examined his sword. Yesterday, Haku had cleared him, ready for battle. Yes, Zabuza-sama, Haku said as she adjusted her sunban pouch. Together, we shall defeat the Kanohanin. Zabuza hummed. He was looking forward to another round with the Kanohanin, 
namely the two Jonan he had faced. At the same time, he was mindful of what could happen. Do not underestimate them, Haku, he said. Last time I did that, you had to pull my ass out of trouble. We may not be so lucky if they manage to get the better of us. Haku bowed to him. Understood, she said. I will be careful not to underestimate our enemy. There was a slight grimace on her face. One she was quick to hide, but not fast enough for Zabuza to have missed it. I'll take care of the Jonin, he said, carefully eyeing his partner slash tool. You'll fight their brats. But remember, do not underestimate them. Especially the ones that arrived with Shursway. They look like they can put up a fight. You may have to use your Kekiai Genkai against them. Haku showed no outward reaction, but Zabuza knew she did not like using her Kekiai Genkai. Having come from Kiri himself, he understood why. Yet another foolish action done by our foolish leader, he thought to himself. Even for a bloodthirsty bastard like himself, the purges had not set well with Zabuza. I understand, Zabuza sama, there it was again, that slight note of hesitation in her voice. Zabuza knew that Haku did not like violence. Even when she did fight, she would go out of her way not to kill her opponent. But usually, she was better at hiding it. Zabuza felt his frown deepening. Haku, he said. Are you sure you are all right? You see a little off. He closely watched the young Kunoichi in front of him. He noticed a moment of surprise flashing across her face. But it quickly vanished as Haku put on a calm expression. Nothing, Zabuza Sam, she said. I am simply pensive about our battle tomorrow. Zabuza eyed Haku carefully. Really now? He asked. What makes you so worried? Haku bit the bottle off her lip. I fear that the Kanohanin may have other tricks. Up their sleeves, she said. It was a blatant lie. We do not know much about what our opponents are capable of. Aside from what bingo books say and what we have seen already. They may have other hidden abilities. Zabuza snorted. Of course they do, he said in a mocking tone. What shinobi worth their name doesn't? Haku winced at the criticism from him. Zabuza would never admit it, and he would slaughter anyone who would dare to suggest it, but he did feel the tiniest tinge of guilt. All I am saying is that we should be careful, Haku said. I do not wish to lose you, Zabuza-sama. Zabuza looked at Haku for the longest time in silence. Then he sighed and walked past the girl. You do not have to worry about that, he said. He placed his sword on his back. I will not die so easily. Not before I achieve my goals. A smile spread across Haku's face. That is a relief to hear from you, Zabuza-sama, she said. Zabuza nodded at the kunoichi. I know you do not like this, he said, sitting on the bed. But we are close to finishing our business here. Then, after that, we can see about that break we discussed. Haku's smile widens. Yes, Zabuza-sama, she said. Zabuza nodded. A vacation did sound good. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.